Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again today, I will be your reader. As with every quarter century in human history, there was a lot going on in the world during the last 25 years of the 19th century. Coining the phrase, how soon we forget, may be a bit of an exaggeration for us in 2023, since none of us were around to experience the happenings of those long gone days. What were some of the key highlights of 1875 to 1900? I choose some here randomly from a particularly long list. 1875, the Specie Resumption Act passes Congress. What was that? It allows for legal tender to be exchanged for gold. The act also reduces the number of greenbacks in circulation. The U.S. makes a treaty with Hawaii, allowing the import of goods to be duty free. It also asserts that no other power can take over Hawaii. The Civil Rights Act is passed, which states that no one can be denied equal access to public facilities. Here's an interesting one for you. The Molly Maguires, an Irish miners group is broken up after their leadership is convicted of murder for its harsh tactics in Pennsylvania. However, their efforts did bring to light the terrible condition of the miners and eventually led to improvements. The Second Sioux Nation War begins and lasts through the fall and the winter of 1875. By the following summer, they will have been defeated through the efforts of the U.S. military. 1879, Thomas Edison creates the first commercially viable light bulb. 1880, the U.S. population exceeds 50 million. And to put that in perspective, the current population is reported at 326 million. 1881, Clara Barton creates the American Red Cross. 1886, the Statue of Liberty, Liberty Enlightening the World is dedicated. In 1890, National American Women's Suffrage Association was founded. 1891, James Naismith invents basketball. I'm sure you've wondered about that a million times. 1896, Henry Ford builds his first automobile. 1898, the USS Maine explodes in Havana, Cuba Harbor, precipitating the Spanish-American War. Something else quite exceptional was unfolding, though, in the late 19th century. And much of it was inspired by a man by the name of John Muir in the years around 1892. In 1892, Scottish American preservationist John Muir founded the Sierra Club. The club was one of the first large scale environmental preservation organizations in the world. As today's author notes, and I quote, in the late 19th century, as humans came to realize that our rapidly industrializing and globalizing societies were driving other animal species to extinction, a movement to protect and conserve them was born. Names like Aldo Leopold and Rachel Carson 
play significant roles, as does the birth of organizations like the Audubon Society in 1905, and later the World Wildlife Fund. Parenthetically, I muse. 1892, 2023, with the everyday passing of one species or another passing into extinction, and the list of endangered species growing rapidly, how slow our progress seems to have been in the 131 years since John Muir's attempts to jolt us into reality. That was parenthetical. According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, the world's most comprehensive information source on the global conservation status of animal, fungi, and plant species. There are currently at least 38,500 species under threat and over 16,300 species believed to be endangered. <laughs> Saturday, May 20th, is World Endangered Species Day. And as it is every year, now on the third Saturday of May. As a salute to World Endangered Species Day 2023, our book in today's spotlight is titled, Beloved Beasts, Fighting for Life in an age of extinction, authored by Michelle Niehaus and published in 2021. Award-winning environmental journalist Ben Goldfarb praises the book as a, quote, definitive history of the conservation movement in all its turbulent, passionate, problematic glory. The centuries-long campaign to protect our fellow creatures finally has the literary epic it deserves. But, as always, before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Michelle Niehaus, spelled N-I-J-U-I-S. As a contributing editor for Smithsonian Magazine, Michelle Niehaus is also very well known to conservation readers of the New York Times, The Atlantic, Nature Magazine, Scientific American, National Geographic, Audubon, and Orion, among many other outlets. The award-winning science journalist hails from Poughkeepsie, New York, and is a 1996 alumna of Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Niels received the 2006 Walter Sullivan Award for Excellence in Science Journalism from the American Geophysical Union, a 2006 Science Journalism Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Media Award from the American Institute of Biological Sciences, and three additional awards from the American Society of Journalists and Authors. Niehaus has also been a finalist for the National Academy's Communication Award. It is often noted that Niehaus doesn't avoid the realities of where conservation was built on a foundation of nationalism, sexism, and racism. As she writes, quote, the movement with roots in elite circles in North America and Europe often overlook the ability of people to manage the species they live alongside. In addition to her authorship of Beloved Beasts, Niehaus has also published The Science Writer's Handbook and 
the science writer's essay handbook. Michelle Diaz ardently continues her writings on conservation biology from her home in White Salmon, Washington, and around the world. Beloved species fighting for life in the age of extinction. I've said that wrong. Beloved beasts fighting for life in the age of extinction. Another award-winning science journalist, well known for coining the term and the action forest bathing, writes this sound assessment of beloved beasts. Quote, Michelle Niehaus has written a book that is both a beautiful, wise history and a measured call to action. By remembering the messy, big-hearted, sometimes nearsighted, but ultimately hopeful efforts of those before us, we can be smarter as we embark on the profound human project of saving species other than only our own. I certainly could not agree more. To better understand the present, it is always wise to review the past, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in order to gain a valuable perspective. Beloved Beast traces the movement's history from early battles to save charismatic species such as the American bison and the bald eagle to today's global effort to defend life on a much, much larger scale. Quoting again, at once thoughtful and thought-provoking, Beloved Beasts tells the story of the modern conservation movement through the lives and ideas of the people who built it, making a crucial addition to the literature of our troubled time. This from Elizabeth Colbert, author of The Sixth Extinction. As the book's cover jacket notes, <coughs> excuse me, quote, as the destruction of other species continues and the effects of climate change wreak havoc on our world, Beloved Beast charts the ways conservation is becoming a movement for the protection of all species including our own. In my humble opinion, I found the history of conservation under the hovering dark clouds of destruction and extinction exceptionally more significantly thought-provoking than any knowledge before reading this book. A few insightful observers of the natural world woke to the reality of a grim future well more than a century ago, and their efforts were more struggle than success. And continue they did, until finally a few more, then a lot more, joined them to create a movement. The path to today has been more than a labor of love for the natural world around us. It has truly been a labor of necessity. Decide for yourself when you read the book if it could be too late. I'm going to begin the book this morning with parts of her first chapter. The first chapter is an Aesop's fable, actually. Aesop's Swallows, if you happen to know it. Uh, but rather than talk about the fable, I'm going to talk about the conclusions as a result of listing the fable in the beginning. So let me draw, uh, read some of the conclusions she draws here in her first chapter. In the middle of the 19th century, complacent humans learned that they were both less exceptional and more powerful than they had believed. 
From Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, they learned that their ties to other animals were far closer than previously thought. They also came to realize that their rapidly industrializing and globalizing societies could drive species into extinction and, in fact, had already done so, first on remote ocean islands and then much closer to home. The most powerful and powerfully destructive civilizations on Earth are still absorbing this double shock. No matter how creed or culture, most of us would agree that animals we domesticate for companionship, labor, and sustenance shouldn't be abused. Through our definitions of abuse may vary widely. Less clear are our responsibilities towards animals hunted for food and sport. And even murkier are those toward animals who are annoying, dangerous, or allegedly useless. The understanding that humans are capable of exterminating entire groups of organisms raised a new question. Why should any of us make sacrifices, even in the short term, to ensure the persistence of other species on the planet. Until very recently, Western philosophers and religious scholars paid little attention to such questions, and many scientists shied away from them. Laws that try to answer them often raise more dilemmas than they settle. And Aesop, well, Aesop would probably laugh and wish us luck. This book is about the humans who have devoted their lives to these questions. The scientists, bird watchers, hunters, self-taught philosophers, and others who have countered the power to destroy species with the whys and the hows of providing sanctuary. Each person profiled here stood or stands at a turning point in the story of modern species conservation. A story which, for better and sometimes worse, still guides the international movement to protect life on Earth. Most early conservationists were privileged North Americans and Europeans, and no wonder. Location and education enabled them to recognize the effects of humans on other species and money and status freed them to take controversial positions. While the societies around them were busy forgetting their dependence on the rest of life, they were forming a new kind of attachment to it, caring not only about individual animals, but about the survival of species. Though they often use pragmatic arguments to convert others to their cause, their personal motivations ran deeper, for many had started keeping companies with members of other species to escape their own troubles. Some were painfully shy or burdened with mental or physical illness. Some were separated from spouses at a time when divorce was a scandal or drawn to their own gender when homosexuality was taboo. Most of them knew something about suffering and they found consolation in the sights and sounds of other forms of life. Their passion for species often began with colorful birds or large showy mammals, but it grew to include the tiny, the unknown, the stationary, and even the despised, and importantly, the relationships among them all. More often than not, these conservationists failed to save the kinds of life they loved. They were defeated by indifference, their own blind spots, or the human instinct for increase. But more often than many of us realize, they succeeded, and their intellectual descendants continue to succeed today. The story of modern species conservation 
is full of people who did the wrong things for the right reasons and the right things for the wrong reasons. It begins in wealthy countries and in colonized territory. Its early chapters are shadowed by racism and some conservationists still hold blinkered views of their fellow humans, causing them to mislay blame for the damage they seek to contain. Many conservationists are unfamiliar with their movement's history. As geographer William Adams observes, they tend to ricochet between evolutionary time and the crisis of the moment, with the result that each generation has revived old arguments and repeated mistakes. Yet what began as a series of running battles to protect charismatic animal species has developed over the past century and a half and through countless twists and turns into a global effort to defend life on a larger scale. Now, as the destruction of species continues and the effects of climate change escalate, conservationists worldwide are fighting for the future of all species, including our own. To consumers of modern media, the story of species conservation doesn't look much like a story. It looks like a jumble of tragedies and emergencies. The last Yangtze River dolphin, the last two northern white rhinos, both female, the soon to be last vaquita, obituaries and near obituaries relieved only by sporadic heroics and temporary successes. It takes place on a bleak present and a much bleaker future. It tempts us with the fantastical resurrected herds of woolly mammoths and the exceptional extinction averted one costly, awkward, artificial insemination at a time. Perhaps most dangerously, it tempts us with despair. It's easy to forget that the world we live in is as far richer is far richer, thanks to those who found convincing reasons and the required means to provide sanctuary to other species. Without their work, there would likely be no bison, no tigers, and no elephants even. There would be few, if any, whales, wolves, or egrets. And there would likely be no international tradition of conservatism. Over centuries of alliances and arguments, conservation has expanded beyond its privileged beginnings, establishing a movement that is shaped by many people, many places, and many species. We can learn from this tradition, from its successes and failures, its oversights and insights, but while new technology from drones to cryopreservation to gene editing may well assist future conservationists, there is still no shortcut through the difficult work of protecting living organisms and the places they need to survive. And there is still no substitute for the emotional connection with other animals and other species. The love of life that inspired the first modern conservationist and continues to sustain so many today. Humans and their fellow animals are indeed facing novel and pressing problems. The climate is changing as never before in human history. Frogs, bats, and salamanders are suffering their own pandemics, dying from diseases spread by human activities. An estimated one million species are now threatened with extinction, including as many as quarter of all animal and plant species. Organized crime and entrenched corporate interests threaten conservation efforts, and in many places, 
conservationists themselves. Between 2002 and 2019, at least 1,800 people were murdered in the course of defending land, water, plants, and animals from poaching and other human insults. Fantasy and despair are tempting, but history can help us resist them. The past accomplishments of conservation were not inevitable, and neither are its predicted failures. We can move forward by understanding the story of struggle and survival we already have, and seeing the possibilities in what remains to be written. In its broadest sense, conservation is the prevention of waste or loss. Measures to prevent the waste or loss of certain kinds of fish, birds, and mammals for spiritual, practical, and self-interested reasons are likely as old as the images of steppe bison painted on cave walls by Paleolithic hands, and they have been and still are employed by societies large and small, poor and powerful. The Indian emperor Ashoka, who converted to Buddhism in the third century BCE, forbade the killing of parrots, tortoises, porcupines, bats, ants, and, quote, all four-footed creatures that are neither useful nor edible. Marco Polo reported that Kublai Khan who ruled the Mongol Empire in the 13th century, prohibited the hunting of hares, deer, and large birds between March and October, quote, that they may increase and multiply. Under the draconian forest law system imposed by medieval English kings, hunting was reserved for royal pleasure and royal profit. The people in this book saw the need for a more specific kind of conservation, a sustained international campaign to protect other species from human-caused global extinction. While the conservation movement was variously ignored, disrupted, and idealized older forms of conservation, recent generations of conservationists are recognizing that their work is part of what their predecessor, Aldo Leopold, called, quote, the oldest task in human history, and are striving to synthesize the best of old and new. Early conservationists were divided by arguments between utilitarians, who were primarily interested in sustaining herds and forests for human use, and preservationists, who mostly wanted to protect species and landscapes from human interference. Since then, the conservation movement, whose founders included many wealthy sportsmen, had sometimes come into conflict with the environmental movement, which was sparked by public concern about global problems, such as air and, of course, water pollution. The animal welfare movement, which began as an effort to improve the lives of domesticated animals, had been ally and antagonist to both conservation and environmentalism. Yet all of these movements are closely related, and their stories overlap. Today, conservation is defined in numerous ways. It can include, for instance, the protection of scenic vistas, and open spaces. But the persistence of species and of an animal species in particular remains a vital concern of the movement and the history and further and future of that concern is the focus of this book. Conservation has long been a collaboration between passionate experts and passionate amateurs and it blows through disciplinary boundaries drawing from science politics, law, philosophy, and other fields. 
its internal debates are lively and often fascinating, but they are almost always complicated by the use of terms that have come to mean very different things to different people. Conservation is complicated enough. So I've minimized my use of words such as nature, wild, and wilderness. When I do use them, I've tried to make clear which nature or which wilderness I'm talking about. I use wildlife, another term with multiple definitions and various orthographies, simply to distinguish non-domesticated animals from their domesticated counterparts, including human beings. In general, the terms I use to identify humans, Victorian, Blackfeet, White, Buddhist, are the terms used by the people themselves. There's one more word I use sparingly here, hope. Hope is the subject of much discussion in conservation circles, both the need for it and the lack of it. Yet few, if any, of the most influential early conservationists were motivated by what might be called hope. They were motivated by many other things, delight, outrage, data, but they had little confidence that the work they were moved to do would succeed in rescuing the species they loved. They did it anyway. As Leopold, in one of his gr grimmer moods, wrote to a friend, quote, that the human situation is hopeless, should not prevent us from doing our best, end quote. With that much conversation about Mr. Leopold, and of course my mention of Mr. Muir earlier, I'm going to skip several chapters to go to four, chapter four, skip two chapters here. Um, even though there are earlier thoughts and thought waves, let's say, about conservation, it's really not until we get to Leopold and Muir that uh, things start to pick up. So the name of the chapter is The Forester, which was Leopold, and The Green Fire, which is what was referred to Muir. It's a fairly lengthy chapter, and so I'm going to read only as far as I can, just to give you more of the feeling, especially the history of these two significant people. Remember, Muir was the one who started the Sierra Club, which was instrumental in the early parts of the movement. So the forester and the green fire. The slump-shouldered wooden shack on the floodplain of the Wisconsin River doesn't look like much, and in most respects, it's not. The former chicken coop, its unpainted siding patched and repatched, stands in the generous shade of an old sugar maple, its front door flapping open, and a small square window gazing at arriving visitors like a gently watchful eye. Behind the shack, at a demure distance, lists a narrow wooden outhouse. I first visited this shack on a muggy summer morning in the company of about a dozen conservation biologists from all over North America. We filed through the door and crammed inside where we inspected the stone fireplace, the pine roof beams, and the set of wooden bunks. Chipped enamel bowls hung on the wall along with a well-worn cross-cut saw. Two kerosene lamps were tucked into a corner, below an old-fashioned wire toaster made for fireplace use. I was raised Catholic, so I get it, one scientist said with amusement. We have to see the relics. The bowls, the lamps, the toaster, they were relics, and yet not. There were no velvet ropes inside the shack, no silent guards. Visitors lounge on the benches, perch on the heath, hearth, <laughs> and sometimes break the glasses. A half-used roll of paper towels hung just outside the door. We try to keep it to Leopold's standards, one guide said, which are not very high. In 1935, 
A few months after his impassioned speech at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum, Aldo Leopold decided to invest in a piece of land. He wanted a place where he could hunt, his children could play, his wife Estella could hone her companionship, her championship archery skills, and the whole family could undertake a conservation experiment of its own. He poked around the countryside near Madison and found 80 abandoned acres along the Wisconsin River, priced for a professor at $8 an acre. The land had been home to the Ho-Chunk people until most were forced out by a lopsided 1837 treaty, then to white settlers until most were forced out by the Dust Bowl. The sandy soil was exhausted and the chicken coop was a wreck piled with manure. The mosquitoes were ferocious, but Leopold was jubilant about the land's opportunities and soon the rest of the family loved it as much as he did. During weekend visits, the Leopolds cleaned the inside of the coop and installed a clay floor. They built a bunk room out of salvaged lumber nicknamed the West Wing and the outhouse, which they called the Parthenon. The youngest Leopold, also named Estella and known as Estella Jr., was shocked to learn in school that there was another Parthenon. Despite the improvements, the Leopold children once heard a cry of amazement from a passing car. Look, mother, someone lives there. Over the next decade and a half, the family planted trees, some 3,000 pine seedlings every year. All right, so now you grow, Estella Sr. would say with mock sternness to each newly settled pine. At first, most of the pines died, but after the drought eased in 1940, the young trees took hold. Leopold also started planting a scrap of prairie using the crude but effective method of digging up a square yard of native grasses elsewhere, plopping the chunk of dirt on the roof of his car and relocating it to his land. The University's Arboretum's Prairie Restoration Project is the oldest in the world. The Leopold's is the second oldest. While Leopold shoveled a manure, planted the eroded riverbanks, and turned worn out cornfields back to prairie, he took note of the species growing, singing, and moving around him, and he encouraged his children to do the same. In the very early mornings, while sitting up the fire, campfire with a coffee pot on the boil, he listened as the songbirds started their day using a meter to measure the sunlight each time a species joined the chorus. His observations accumulated in a series of shack journals, becoming the raw material for some of conservation's most famous texts. Aldo Leopold is the kind of author whom people cite as an influence, even if they've never picked up one of his books. He was almost dangerously eloquent. Among the usual pantheon of North American conservation writers, perhaps only Henry David Thoreau and Sierra Club founder John Muir are as frequently quoted and misquoted. Well, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. One of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. I am glad I shall never be young without wild country to be young in. These Leopoldisms and others have been proverbial for at least three generations of conservationists. Leopold's best-known work, the collection of essays published posthumously in 1949 as A Sand County Almanac, has sold more than two million copies and been translated into 14 languages, including Latvian, Korean, and Turkish. Though Leopold's language was often simple, his thinking was not. 
Quote, his conviction was that conservation had to rest on a base that included not only the natural sciences, but also philosophy, ethics, history, and literature, writes Leopold biographer and scholar Kurt Maine. And Leopold's reading and writing reflected that conviction. His ideas changed over time, and it's not unusual to hear conservationists on opposing sides of internal debate lobbying or lobbying Leopold quotes at one another, each certain that the great man is an ally. But over the course of his life, through thousands upon thousands of published and unpublished pages, Leopold burnished two bedrock principles of species conservation. The first is that each species requires a combination of space, food, and shelter that ecologists call habitat, and which Leopold referred to as land. The second is that all species need predators, even, in most cases, the predators themselves. And neither habitat nor predators, Leopold maintained, could be adequate protected, adequately protected by laws alone. When Leopold was born in January 1887 in Burlington, Iowa, William Hornaday was building his bison display at the National Museum in Washington, D.C., and George Bird Grinnell was trying to keep up with the success of his new Audubon Society. On the plains, the slaughter of the bison was still underway and would soon lead to new human tragedies. After the dry, hot summer of 1890, the Lakata Sioux, many of whom had switched to agriculture as bison numbers dropped, faced both a failed harvest and radical reductions in government rations. Desperate, some began to perform the ghost dance, a ritual that the Peyuti spiritual leader Wovoka promised would bring a new world into being. Government agents misinterpreted the dance as a prelude to battle, leading to a standoff that ended with the massacre of more than 150 Lakota Sioux by U.S. soldiers on the banks of Wounded Knee Creek. The same year, the superintendent of the national census declared on somewhat shaky evidence that the western boundary of white settlement had progressed all the way across the continent to the Pacific Ocean. The so-called frontier line was gone. This announcement excited far more concern for the conquerors than the conquered, especially after historic historian Frederick Jackson Turner proposed that the frontier, which he called the meeting point between savagery and civilization had inclined the American character toward democracy and individualism. Turner's thesis, adopted and popularized by Theodore Roosevelt and others, fed urban elite's fears about the future of white male vitality. If the frontier had forged the national character, what would become of the national character without it? On a high limestone bluff on the western bank of the Mississippi River, in a house built by his grandfather, Charles Starker, Aldo Leopold and his three younger siblings grew up shielded from the savageries of civilization. Much like young Hornaday 30 years earlier, Leopold roamed the Iowa countryside, often searching for birds. When his parents gave him a copy of Frank Chapman's Handbook of Birds of Eastern North America, it cemented his habit of describing the world around him. Quote, from my own observations, I have found that during the nesting season, when the young are dependent, about six weeks, the old wrens carry insects into the box for 12 hours each day at the rate of five times every minute. 
14-year-old Leopold wrote that in his school composition book. He added, nothing could be more suggestive of complete content and happiness than the song of the wren. That written at age 14. Leopold's first conservation mentor was his father, a former traveling salesman who had peddled products ranging from roller skates to barbed wire before settling down to run a desk manufacturing company in Burlington. Carl Leopold, who came from a large family of German immigrants, had no formal training in conservation or science, but he had hunted since he was a boy and over the years, he had watched duck numbers drop. Though local restrictions on which species could be hunted and when dated back to colonial times, states had only begun to limit how many animals could be killed at a time. Iowa was the first state to do so in 1878. And those rules tended to be generous to a fault. The elder Leopold understood that hunters needed to restrain themselves in order to preserve their sport, so he strictly limited the number and kinds of birds he killed. And while he delighted in a successful hunt, he sometimes left his gun at home, making it clear to his young sons that time outdoors was more important than the chase. For Aldo, never a regular churchgoer, these adventures were his Sunday school. In 1904, with the encouragement of his mother, Clara, Aldo left Burlington for preparatory school in New Jersey. His chatty letters home detailed his almost daily tramps beyond campus. Quote, I went north across the country about seven miles and then circus circled back toward the west he wrote to his mother soon after his arrival in January. He described sightings of more than a dozen bird species, concluding that he was more than pleased with this country. His classmates thought Leopold eccentric, but they admired his enthusiasm and they sometimes joined his outings. He was shy with an internal reserve that was sometimes taken for haughtiness, but his new friends loosened him up. Photographs from the time show a young man with prematurely receding blonde hair and a face that was forbidding when serious, but could be transformed by his warm, wide grin. Though Leopold steadily checked new bird species off his list, I am now acquainted with 274 species of birds in the United States, he wrote. His sisters went beyond Linnaean classification, which he would later dismiss as baptizing species and describing feathers and bones. He noted that goldfinches and pine siskins fed together, and that Phoebes tended to gather around blooming heads of skunk cabbage. He was awakened to the wonders of plants by Asa Gray's Manual of Botany later a well-thumbed reference at the Leopold Shack, and earnestly pronounced Charles Darwin's The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms to be of much interest and surprise. He was curious about other species, but he was fascinated by the relationships among them. Let's read another page because we do bring in Mr. Muir here. For a young man like Leopold, gripped since childhood by what he jokingly called Woods Fever, inclined toward science, but idealistic enough to aspire to national service, the obvious place to further his education was Yale University, where pioneering forester Gifford Pinchot had co-founded the country's first graduate school of forestry in 1900. When Leopold arrived at Yale in the fall of 1905, Pinchot was serving as chief of the U.S. Forest Service under President Theodore Roosevelt, overseeing a massive expansion of the national forest system. Pinchot is usually remembered for his very public quarrel with John Muir, his one-time friend and mentor, over San Francisco's plans to build a dam and reservoir in the Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. 
Muir, the survivor of a rigidly disciplined childhood in Scotland and Wisconsin, awoke to the wonders of the world around him after being temporarily blinded in his 20s, and for the rest of his life he was happiest in California's Sierra Nevada, traveling by foot and carrying little more than a walking stick. In the spring of 1903, Roosevelt, who like many others was moved by Muir's poetic descriptions of the Sierra, requested his company on a camping trip to Yosemite. I do not want anyone with me but you, he wrote. Roosevelt and Muir got off to a shaky start, for neither wanted to let the other get a word in edgewise. Muir made things worse by trying to decorate the president's lapel with twigs. But they warned to each other, and their conversations around the campfire helped persuade Roosevelt to strengthen protections for Yosemite and to create the dozens of national parks, wildlife refuges, and monuments that became part of his legacy. They may also have led Roosevelt to question his devotion to hunting. Quote, Mr. Roosevelt, when are you going to get beyond the boyishness of killing things? Muir recalled asking one evening. Are you not getting far enough along to leave that off? Roosevelt replied, Muir, I guess you are right. Well, that's an introduction to two of the great leaders of the conservationist movement, um, Leopold and Muir. And uh, this particular chapter is, very, is quite amusing, actually, as the two men sort of uh, vie for leadership or vie for first place, let's say, <laughs> of the movement, which wasn't a movement then, but it was certainly positive thinking. Um, and it, it's a wonderful, very, very fun chapter. The remaining chapters of the book, of course, follow us through the years uh, from everything about the Sierra Club, which I mentioned earlier. And, now we know why the club was called Sierra Club. Um, but the chapters after that, the professor and the elixir of life, the eagle and the whooping crane, the scientist to escape the tower, that's quite a good one actually, the rhino and the commons, the few who saved the many. That's a uh, conclusive chapter, although there is a conclusion, another small chapter, Homo amphibious. Well, we certainly know amphibious, meaning the water. So man of the water, I'm not going to tell you about it. It goes for only nine pages, so it's definitely worth reading. It's a fascinating book. I must say my knowledge was very, very slim before reading the book. And I'm glad I read it. Uh, I am surprised at the beginnings back at the late part of the 19th century. We hear so much about it today and in the last 25, 30 years. But to think that things were brewing that far back, 133 years or so. Anyway, it's a very good book and it's a great uh, dedication to uh, World Extin Extinguished, no, Extinction Day. And here's just uh, coming up very soon. So Michelle Niehaus is the author of Beloved Beast, Fighting for Life in an Age of Extinction. I suggest you read it. I think everyone should, and we'd probably be more successful as a, as a world, and certainly as a country. Well, let me tell you a little bit about next week's book, which is another salute. We have had four or three so far this month. Now, number four and the last of the month is a salute to a special day in the month of May. Um, and of course, you're thinking ahead of me, you would realize it is Memorial Day. And Memorial Day is on Monday, the 29th of May. And I found a fascinating book uh, to read um, after going through probably 200, actually. Uh, the title alone caught my attention, being a former student of uh, Greek classics um, and Roman history, uh, An American Odysseus. An American Odysseus, The Long Journey Home. The title is fascinating, I hope you'll think. The author is Mr. Charles Chapman, and it was published in 2018. It is the true story 
of a triumphant journey through a childhood of abuse, instability, and uncertainty. A young man desires to become a priest, but instead becomes a soldier. The story progresses to a challenging military career and years of combat, each fraught with its own unique set of challenges and obstacles to be overcome. This story revolves around a young man's torturous journey through childhood into the hell of war and the obstacles to be overcome to bring himself to the journey's end, long yearned for. What you will read is an exaltation of the human spirit driven by determination, humor, and stubbornness. Isn't that the journey of Odysseus <laughs> back from the Trojan Wars? It took him 10 years. An American Odysseus, the long journey home as a salute to Memorial Day 2023 by Charles Chapman. I hope you'll join me for it. It's a well-written book. Uh, and so personal, so remarkably personal, uh, especially the hell of war. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed Beloved Beasts and some of the facts behind the conservation movement. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please press that small icon there, the thumbs up. <laughs> it's a vote of confidence for us, really. And you may wish to share it with other friends. Um, and of course, there's that icon standing there as well. Please offer a comment, uh, any suggestions uh, that you might have either about the book or the movement or the world today, the world tomorrow, anything. We'd be very fascinated to hear your response. And also comment on a favorite book you may have, not necessarily in the world of conservation, but in any literary world from any period in history. Uh, we really appreciate those. We're about to select the books uh, for the month of June. So if you send me a comment immediately, I'll get on it, so to speak. <laughs> and also, I encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel, if you're watching this on YouTube, to stay on top of all of the great programming, especially during the summer. And one of the very active organizations that adds to our website with uh, reported programs is the Audubon Society. There we go. Bravo. Also, uh, this keeps us in the number one spot uh, at the public library is the most YouTube channel subscribers of all of the public libraries in the state of Maine, from top to bottom, east to west, and from small to large. So we have been there about 10 months now uh, in the number one slot. So simply subscribe. It doesn't take anything but your email address so that we can send you an occasional notice of something coming up in the programming world. Please join us. Thank you very much for being with me today. And um, I hope your week ahead is uh, healthy, first of all, safe and enjoyable as far as the weather goes. Today's a chilly day, but the sun will shine again tomorrow, somebody once said. I hope you'll join me next week. Thank you very much. Try hard to be happy. It's a choice. Make it your choice. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>